Okay, so I was perusing Reddit stocks the other day and I stumbled upon a post by user Homeless Alchemist that warned of how ridiculously high Robinhood share-based compensation is. Usually it's not a good idea to take investing advice from people that describe themselves as homeless, but this guy's due diligence seemed legit. In the post, he pointed out that Robinhood's stock-based compensation was $1.6 billion in 2021, despite the company only making $1.8 billion in revenue. Okay, seems super high, but my initial thinking was that this was a bunch of one-time stuff associated with the IPO. But then he also pointed out that they plan to pay out an additional $930 million to a $1 billion this year. Wait, what? This isn't meant to be a primer on stock-based compensation or best practices in management comp. But optically, if your stock chart looks like, well, like this, and you are losing money hand over fist, it's probably not the best thing to plan to pay out the equivalent of 10% of your market cap in bonuses. But that's just one man's view. I try to make these videos unbiased, but for full disclosure, I did say this about the company in my weekly wrap-up last week after they reported their Q4. Revenue sucked, the guidance sucked, the user base declined, and everyone seems to hate them. Anyway. So before we get any deeper, I should state that Homeless Alchemist post was accurate. The company had $1.57 billion in share-based comp in 2021, and yep, they are planning on that only decreasing by 35 to 40% in 2022. Putting that together, it appears that Robinhood is budgeting for around $943 to $1 billion in share-based comp. But how crazy is this amount? Well, taking the midpoint of management's guidance and using the current market cap of the company, that works out to around 8.9% dilution for 2022. This figure dwarfs the S&P 500 average of around 0.4%. But what about the worst offenders on the S&P 500? Are they just as egregious? Well, even they are still paying out chum change compared to Robinhood. Complete madness. And of course, to that you might say something like, yeah, Ryan, well, those are established companies. It's not fair to compare them to a newly IPO'd company. Well, that doesn't really hold up either. The only one close to Robinhood is Palantir, which has taken a lot of flack for all the fun coupons it's been giving its founder. Okay, so now that we've established that Robinhood likes to give away shares like their post-Great War Deutschmarks, I want to dig into where this money is actually going to go. The immediate thought for most people should be, are the founders just unscrupulously enriching themselves at shareholder expense? Its two founders are Vladimir Tenev and Baiju Bat, a couple of Stanford math nerds who got rich and decided to grow their hair out. The pair own significant stakes in the company, particularly its Class B shares, which come equipped with 10 times the voting power of the publicly traded Class A's and are fully convertible should they ever want to sell them. Page 9 of their Q4 press release gives us a bit of a breakdown of where that $1.6 billion of share compensation went. 39% of it went to the technology division and 56% went to general administrative, which is where the founders and most of the C-suite are. I figure that understanding how they gave away shares in 2021 would provide good insight into how they would likely do it in 2022. And to that end, I trawled through all of the company's Form 4 filings with the SEC. But don't worry, there weren't too many of them. Anyway, the CEO Vlad went into the IPO with 52 million shares of common stock and 39 million of restricted stock units. On IPO, 4 million of those RSUs vested, he kept 774,000 shares and cashed the rest out. The column on the right is how many shares he could have cashed out if he wanted to. Also, with the IPO, the common stock class got eliminated, and he converted nearly all of his shares into those neat super voting class B shares. After that, Vlad had around 240,000 shares vesting quarterly. In total, in 2021, he cashed out around 3.5 million shares out of the 4.5 million that he could have. Additionally, in all those fun Form 4s I plowed through, they kindly disclosed the share price sold at. So from that, we know that Vlad's stock was worth around 128 million. I'll spare you going through the other founder buys you bat, but suffice it to say his shares were roughly the same. So in total, the two founders sold around $260 million in 2021. But for calculating stock-based comp, they don't use the amount of shares sold, they use the amount of shares created, which is decently higher. And for the two founders, that was around $330 million. Damn. Now as far as trying to extrapolate that into 2022, I built a long drawn out thing walking through the different RSU classes, but my wife said it was boring and reminded her of her second year accounting class. Oof. <laughs> Anyway, so here's the cliff notes. Going forward, Vlad is going to get around 182,000 shares per quarter through to the third quarter of 2022 associated with his time-based RSUs that vested at the IPO. Next, he's going to get around 58,000 shares a quarter for all of 2022 associated with hitting the $30.45 price threshold at IPO. And no, he doesn't get the $51 ones because the share price needs to be above that level for more than a cup of coffee. A six-month VWAP if we're being technical. And yeah, the other target thresholds seem, let's say, challenger. Now I should pause here for a second to acknowledge that the market value of shares paid out doesn't actually equal the value of stock-based comp. There's some fiddly accrual accounting stuff associated with RSUs spanning multiple periods, like accounting for the probability of unrecognized RSUs being paid out. 
But for our purposes, I think the value of shares being issued is fairly indicative of future stock-based comp. Anyway, so all told, Vlad is only really going to be getting around 775,000 shares this year, unless the stock price miraculously goes up 400% or the board approve another share package, which would actually be the easiest way in the world to invite a pack of activist investors in there. The other founder, Baiju, has an identical RSU package, except like he only got 13.3 million of these ones. So in total, we can only really expect the founders to get around 1.55 million shares in 2022, which at current market prices only works out to around 22.5 million of stock-based comp. In some ways, this is good since it removes the biggest red flag, which is that the founders are grossly enriching themselves at shareholder expense. But if they aren't getting the money, then who is? Now, obviously, the other senior execs have RSU packages as well. For example, CFO Jason Warnick has about 525,000 shares potentially coming his way over the next several years. But I believe the big component is the rank and file employees. To start, let's get two things clear. Firstly, the shares have disappointed both investors and employees alike. Like many of their more techie peers, stock comp is a major component of remuneration to employees and targets are outlined in employment contracts. Robinhood's stock is actually in the neighborhood of its last publicly known private market raise in September 2020 of around 11.7 billion and miles below where it was apparently trading in the private secondary market just before that whole GameStop fiasco. And secondly, the reputation is pretty terrible. People joined Robinhood when it was private because it was a cool trendy fintech, revolutionizing an industry and sticking it to the big banks and Wall Street to boot. Now, their name is more synonymous with things like gamifying trading to get unsophisticated investors to trade and lose more, payment for order flow, and sinister insinuations about underhanded dealings with the likes of Citadel and Melvin Capital. And we can't forget about this little shindig. Oh, that was hard to watch. The result of these two things means that Robinhood has had to be increasingly generous in order to retain and attract talent to work for them. Early signs can probably be seen after the GameStop sitch, where they had to revalue stock packages for around 500 employees to keep them from becoming worthless. It's an uphill battle for the company, but this sort of stuff can't be sustainable. And finally, not only is this level of extreme dilution bad, it actually puts increasing pressure on the shares. With the normal company, this is absorbed into the market pretty easily, but not at this scale. Presumably, some of the newly created stock will be held onto and cherished by the lucky employee receiving it, but most of that is probably going to get sold right away. I mean, hell, even the CEO dumped 78% of the shares he got. To tie this all together, I started digging into Robinhood because the magnitude of the share comp stuff smelt like management was trying to pull something shady. And yeah, maybe issuing all those pre-IPO share grants was pretty punchy. But the real issue here seems to be something much more structural. And how much of that is being forced to pay up big in order to attract and retain talent, or that the labor model isn't scaled appropriately, is an open question. Whatever the case, with users of the platform leveling off, this isn't a problem that the company can simply grow its way out of, and likely needs to take important steps to secure the profitability of the business in the future. And lastly, for anyone savvy enough to figure out the timing of those quarterly RSU payout dates, you might actually have a nice little day trade there. Anyway, that's my quick update on the Robinhood stock.com situation. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please give it a like and maybe consider subscribing for more informative and hopefully entertaining market analysis. This is a new channel, so every little bit helps with the YouTube algorithm thingy. I'm Ryan, and thanks for tuning into Market Lab.